All right, uh, the uh, next thing that we need to um, talk about is the squeeze theorem, right? So the squeeze theorem for sequences works in pretty much the same way as it does for functions, right? So if we have three sequences, A, B, and C, um, and we know that Bn is sandwiched or squeezed between A, N, and, and C, N, so, and if at the same time we know that um, the limit of a n and the limit of c n is the same number l then the limit of b n is also going to be l so th this is how it works um so here is an illustration and basically maybe a little um a little know that you know if the inequalities are not sharp then it also works that that's the idea because you know if say um, well, if we know that A is strictly less than B, then we can also say that A is strictly, well, is smaller than or equal to than B. This is true. Uh, so, so to, to apply the squeeze theorem, um, you know, we do not have to use um, non-strict inequalities. So inequalities can, can, can be strict. Now, uh, here is an illustration, so cosine n over n. Um, basically, what we see here is that cosine n is between negative 1 and 1, right? So divided by n, we get minus 1 over n is less than or equal than cosine n divided by n, less than or equal than 1 over n. This approach is 0, this approach is 0, so whatever is in between also approaches zero. Now, let me um, show you an illustration of what it looks like um, in picture, right? So here we have two uh, sequences, A, N, and, and, and C, and yeah, by the way, the squeeze theorem is sometimes called the police theorem, and the intuition here is that the two sequences, A and C, are like uh, two, two cops, right? So this is the first cop, and this is the second cop, uh, and the sequence that is in between them Right, so um, you can think of it as a drunk man that the two cops are escorting to the precinct. So, since the drunk man is sandwiched between the, these these two cops, he cannot escape, and he well basically so both of them follow to the precinct, and so he has to to, to do it too because you know uh, he just cannot escape. Right, so the, uh, the the this drunk man is in between the two cops, and Basically, mathematically, it means that the limit is the same, right? So um, you, you can even plot the, connect them by two continuous lines, so which maybe will make it clearer, right? So and then if you kind of look at what happens eventually for after a large number of steps, then, you know, uh, the two sequences A and, and C, so they become closer and closer to each other, so they approach the, the same limit, so whatever is in between, it has to, to be there too, and it has to follow the, the same thing, right? Um, this is how it works. So the trick in applying the squeeze theorem is in finding the correct uh, inequality. And um, when we work with trigonometric functions, it is pretty much obvious that because sine and cosine are sandwiched between negative 1 and 1, and basically we just throw it in, and we, we get the answer, right? Uh, but it is somewhat trickier to apply squeeze theorem uh, for other situations. And, you know, unlike, well, when we work with functions, usually uh, trigonometric examples are pretty much everything that, that, you, uh, that, that you have with squeeze theorem. Well, when we did um, limits of functions of two variables you saw some examples where uh, squeeze theorem can be used uh, together with um, polar coordinates there yeah? so in order to, to find trigonometry there so we first apply polar coordinates and then we use the trigonometric inequality All right so here is an example of uh, what kind of arises for sequences but we don't really observe it for functions right so because here we have a factorial right so n factorial so which is just the product of numbers from one to to n and you know unlike so 
limits with factorials are very often can be done um, by applying the discrete theorem. At the same time, that there is no kind of standard uh, inequalities that you can just memorize and, and apply. So you have to, to be inventive, right? So what I'm going to do, I am going to show you uh, a method to solve the this limit, which is different from the printed version, right? So uh, now, so three to the n divided by n factorial, right? So our a n is three to the n, which is the product of n copies of number three divided by n factorial, which is the product of numbers one, two, three, and so on up to n. And so we can rewrite it as three divided by one times three divided by two times three divided by three. So let me co continue on for a few uh, for a few more terms. Three divided by four times three divided by five times and so on times three divided by n. Now, now it becomes pretty clear that every time we multiply our uh, uh, the, the elements of our sequence by smaller and smaller numbers, so which kind of means that of course they 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 are going to approach zero. Well, but how do we prove it rigorously using the discrete theorem? Right? So, and the idea here is is the following. So notice that uh, you know we can just. The, the first three terms are just, well, so the product of the first three um, um, numbers here is, is just some, some constant, right? So, and the multipliers uh, become smaller than one after uh, the fourth term, right? So, so here we have three quarters and three quarters is of course less than or equal than three quarters. Uh, but three fifths is again less than or equal than three quarters. And, and so on. So all the next terms, they become smaller and smaller. So which means that every next term is less than or equal than three quarters. Well, most of them are strictly less than three quarters, but it doesn't really matter. So what is important is that this whole thing is a n is therefore going to be smaller than, you know, the, the first three terms. So which is, I guess, three and three cancels out. So this is just nine over two times three quarters to the power raised to the power n minus three. Well, and this is almost a familiar limit, right? So we know that r to the n approaches zero. Well, if r absolute value of r is less than one. So here our r is three quarters. So it is indeed less than one. So it does approach zero. Maybe the only thing that probably uh, may not be immediately clear is the fact that, that there is minus three here, but I guess if you want to get rid of the minus three, so what you can do, you can write it, rewrite it like this. You can re write uh, nine over two times four thirds cubed times three quarters cubed, right? So they, they, these two terms will cancel each other times three quarters to the power n minus three. Right, and here three minus three is just it's just just zero. So this is nine over two times three quarters cubed times three quarters raised to the power n. All right, and now we know that this thing approaches zero. Right, so we have already seen this limit. On the other hand, a n is of course bigger than zero. I mean, it's just by by definition, it's just product of positive numbers, so uh, it, it is positive. So, so now a n is sandwiched between two uh, sequences. So the lower limit is the, the lower bound is just zero, and the upper bound is uh, something that has limit zero. So by the squeeze theorem, we conclude that the limit of uh, a n is zero. Right. So whatever is in between approaches zero. All right, uh, now th this is how we can do it. So th this is kind of my way to do it. Uh, so the printed version of the slides um, is a different, contains a different solution. So maybe you will find it uh, you know, easier to understand. I, I don't know. So yeah, but by the way, zero factorial is one. Yeah, maybe if it is not immediately clear to you why zero factorial is one, 
you you can think of the following thing so um if you have several terms several numbers like i don't know three negative seven 22.5 right so you can add them together right so three plus negative seven plus 22.5 right um but what is the sum of nothing at all i mean so i mean if you have a set of numbers then if that set contains at least one number then you can just add them together and you will get the sum of several numbers but what is the sum of nothing what is the sum of no numbers at all so the, the sum of nothing should be zero because zero is the number such that if you add zero to anything you will get that same number right so which is why the sum of nothing should be zero because the idea is that if you have two sets of numbers and you want to add them all together then you can take the sum of the first set take the sum of the second set and add them together right so that, that's why the sum of nothing should be the number if, such that if you add add it to anything it doesn't change the, the answer well because of the same logic basically if you have several numbers like one i don't know negative three and 22.5 you can multiply them together one times negative three times 22.5 but the product of nothing because of the, the same logic should be the number such that if you multiply it by anything it doesn't change the answer and one times a is is just a right so which is why the product of nothing should should be one so in particular zero factorial is is the, the, the product of nothing so which is why it should be one so it's not just convention i, I wouldn't say that it is convention so i mean it is just it's the only reasonable um, setup to 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 define zero factorial to, to be one. All right. Um, so anyway, so three to the n divided by n factorial. Um, so in the approach that I explained, so I sandwiched it between zero and three quarters to the n, well, multiplied by some constant, but instead. Of this we can uh, look at like this so we can um, uh, just notice that okay the last term is 3 over n and the rest of the terms are smaller than 1 and we still keep the the first three so and then by taking them all together what we get is that uh, we see that uh, 3 to the n divided by n factorial is less than 27 over 2 to n and again, um, we see that it allows us to, to prove that um, since 27 over 2n approaches 0, it means that whatever is sandwiched between 0 and that is going to, to approach 0 too. Okay, um, so the, there is a corollary from the squeeze theorem. I mean, it's kind of like, like a new theorem. Uh, it's a very simple one because um, if the absolute value of a n has limit zero, then the limit of a n itself is also zero, right? So, like, the, this is simply because a n is of course less than or equal than absolute value of a n and bigger than or equal than absolute value of minus or minus absolute value of a n, right? So, if the, this approach is zero, the, this approach is zero, then whatever in, in between also approaches zero. So, but by the way. The converse of the, this theorem is also true, right? So if if we know that the limit of a n is zero, then the limit of absolute value of a n, you know, so we, we just absolute value is um, um, is a continuous function, right? So this is going to be just absolute value of, of, of zero, uh, which is in term in zero. All right, so this theorem is true, not just like works in, in one way, but it works both in, in both ways. All right, so here is the proof of the, this theorem that uses the discrete theorem. Although, to be honest, you, you don't really need this discrete theorem because you can, instead, you can just try the definition of both things and you will see that the definition is exactly the same. Uh, well, here is how we can apply it. So basically, uh, if we have minus 3 raised to the power of n, then since without the minus, we know that the limit is 0, we just 
show, we have just shown it. So then it means that with minus three, the limit is, is still zero. Okay. So when we want to show that uh, the limit of some expression is zero, if that expression has, you know, negative and positive signs, then we can just get rid of the negative and positive signs. That's what the theorem basically tells us. Uh, and that's the end of the sixth part of the lecture.